Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for how you have helped us so far. We continue with your word and we know it is the Holy Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Therefore, we ask you, precious Holy Spirit, that you will put your words in my mouth and you will give life through your word to each one that we hear and even through the speaker to the speaker herself. That God, this word will save the lives of babies from being terminated and will save millions and millions of people from the consequences that, of abortion. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will use this seminar today worldwide to open the eyes of people to the truth about abortion and to bring an end to the holocaust of abortion in our world. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Okay, right now, this is part two of our program. We're going to examine the issue, what is abortion? What really is abortion? We've talked about why we're having the seminar, and we've talked about um, some scriptural um, passages to help us to know the mind of God about abortion. What is abortion? We're going to read Numbers chapter, the Bible, Numbers chapter 35. And I'm going to start reading from verse 15. Numbers 35 from verse 15. It says, These six cities shall be a refuge, both for the children of Israel and for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that kills any person unaware may flee thither. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron, so that he die, he's a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him, smite him with throwing a stone, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meets him, he shall slay him. But if he thrust him of hatred or haul him or haul at him by line of weight that he die, or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meets him. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without laying of weight, or, or with a stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he died, and was not his enemy, neither sought him his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. Here God is talking about somebody taking an instrument of iron, or an instrument of stone, or an instrument of wood, to slay another person because of a hatred, because of an enmity. And the Bible says when he does that, he becomes a murderer. So, in abortion, a baby is in the womb, and somebody doesn't want that baby to live. And instruments are used. Incidentally, a lot of the instruments that are used in abortion are metallic. Just like the Bible says, you talk about, you strike with a metal. You know, maybe you, um, they're using the uh, scalpel or, or whatever they use to scrape and to jar the baby. These are metallic instruments. Or even if it's chemical or whatever instrument, because when God is talking about either you use a, a metal or you use a stone or you use a wood or even later on, he said, even if it's with a fist. So it, the method and the instrument is not the issue. The issue is the death that results from the action, the deliberate death that results from the action. And so abortion is like that. Abortion fits perfectly into that category because a deliberate death has been put in force using various means. We are going to read again Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 to 19, which says, And the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Poor, where you had the Hebrew women in childbirth, and observed them on the, delivery, on the delivery stool. If it's a boy, kill him. So here we have a situation in which Pharaoh had actually tried to cause the women to have an abortion. You see how? The Bible tells us that Pharaoh 
for economic reasons. And today, a lot of abortions are for economic reasons. Pharaoh, for economic reasons, says that the children of Israel were just too many and that they were going to take over the land and he needed to do something to reduce, you know, to make life difficult for them. And what he did was that he put them in, in such hard labor. The Bible said he made them to labor all manners of labor on the field and, and everywhere, taking water, taking, carrying bricks and being really making life very, very difficult for them. Now you can imagine a woman who is pregnant with a, a baby of a month pregnancy or two months or three months or four months a woman like that the baby is likely to be aborted because of the stress and the strain of the of the labor of the physical labor that such a person is going through so pharaoh did that when he saw that it wasn't working and the children of Israel were just getting stronger and stronger and continue to multiply he said kill the baby when they're born and today we have people that are actually advocating that you can kill a baby for up to two weeks after birth there was a parliament or somebody in England who I believe was a member of parliament or so suggesting that what is the difference between a baby two months before he's born and two months after he's born. If you can kill him two months before he's born, well, you should, be, you should be allowed to kill him two months after he's born. If you notice that you don't want him for whatever reason. So this is exactly what Pharaoh did to kill the babies. So abortion is the intentional and deliberate termination of a baby's life in the womb. You deliberately end the baby's life in the womb. That is exactly what this abortion is. And it doesn't matter what kind of instrument that is used. Now we talk about people say, why all this noise about abortion? But there are so many murders that are taking place. Why are you not talking about armed robbery or assassination and things like that? Why is abortion different from other murders? Well, abortion is different because it is a deliberate, calculated, cold-hearted murder of an innocent baby with the participation of its parents. It is deliberate. It was something that was planned. It was something that was calculated. You knew you were going to do it. You, you planned to do it. You, uh, you, you approached those who would help to do it. Or you took means by which you could do it yourself. And it's cold-hearted because the love of a mother for a child is, like, is, 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 is uh, estimated to be the highest form of human love. It is even higher than the love of a husband for a wife, or a wife for a husband, or siblings for one another. The love of a mother for a child is very, very, very strong. And so when that mother, who is supposed to protect the child, is the one planning to kill the child, then it's cold-hearted. It's cold-hearted, it's hard-hearted. And the child is an innocent person. It's innocent because whatever contributed to the conception of the child, the child has no hand in it. He didn't arrange the, the, the sexual intercourse. He didn't arrange the rape. He didn't arrange whatever it is that conceived him. It was planned by somebody. So he's innocent of this whole thing. And yet he's made to pay a, 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 a fatal price, a mortal price for what he's not responsible for. And of, again, another thing that makes abortion so serious is that the baby cannot defend itself. You know, it is a war crime when you attack a people who cannot defend themselves. In this case, the baby is entirely hopeless. He cannot defend himself. So that is what makes abortion worse than other murders. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, God says, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. So in this scenario, God is placing before each one of us ability to make choices. This is something that God has given to man and God is not going to take it away from man. He has given every mankind ability to make choices and he's not going to take that ability from us. The Bible says that we are made in the image of God. In other words, intuitively we know what is right, we know what is wrong. And even here God is telling us that. He is telling us that life is synonymous to blessing. He said, choose life that you and your children may live. So God wants us to make, whenever you are in a confronted, in a situation where you have to choose between life and death, God says, choose life. Whether death as a suicide or death in whatever, God says, choose life. Because life is synonymous with blessing. And death is synonymous with curse. And God says, not just 
to choose life for ourselves, but to choose life for us and our children. In abortion, a choice is made of life for the mother, supposedly, and death for the child. And that brings a curse to the mother. And may I say, please hear, that a lot of times the women too do die. They do die from, from abortion. And even if they don't die, something in them dies. If they don't die, if the whole person doesn't die, something in that woman dies. And that's why women, after abortion, can begin to have a um, psychological problem and they need to be treated for that. Anyone who commits abortion will tell you from the very day they had that abortion, something began to go wrong. Something always will begin to go wrong. If they are honest, they're going to tell you about that. And that is because abortion brings a curse on the person that performs it. No, God doesn't want us to have an abortion. He wants us to choose life. What does this show us about God? It shows that God considers that life is sacred. And life indeed is sacred. There is nobody, no normal person who just wants to die. People struggle to stay alive. Animals struggle to stay alive. Insects struggle to stay alive. Even plants struggle to stay alive. Anything that has life in, its, in itself struggles to stay alive. So God considers that life is sacred. And we are not the one to, to decide whether somebody lives or dies. And if a woman has a baby, it's a proof that God believes in the continuity of the life of that woman. Or if a, a, a family has a, a baby, a expecting a baby, God wants wants that family's existence to continue. God is, he has hope that there's going to be a better tomorrow through that child. Amen? Amen. There are other tags that people give for abortion. They call it menstrual regulation, cleaning up procedure, or you're just removing a clot of blood or any other name that they may give abortion where you live. What happens is that when people give it these names, these names do not accurately represent what abortion is. Because there is nothing that you say you're cleaning up. You're cl having a clean up procedure or you're just regulating your menstruation. Any of those terminologies just say you're removing that baby, the fetus that had just been formed and you're bringing the woman back into, you know, the way she would have been if she wasn't pregnant, you know. So this, ta this tags makes it look like a simple thing. But abortion is never a simple thing because as you're going to, as we are going to study on the methods of abortion, they are very gruesome. All the methods that are used to abortion, they are the most gruesome methods Im imagined that it can be imagined. And all the slangs that are used to portray abortion do not display these gruesome methods. So, I want to ask, because of the common phenomena among some people that say before the baby is born, it's just a clot of blood. There is no stage by which a baby is just a clot of blood. God has not designed the human body to, 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 um, to enclose a useless clot of blood, except there's a disease or a tumor. There is no such thing in the human body. If, the baby, if a baby is formed, a fetus is a human being. Now I'm going to show us some of the pictures of um, tiny little fetuses, you know, and this is a fetus at seven weeks and a fetus at eight weeks, a fetus at nine weeks, and a fetus at 10 weeks. And then you're gonna see fetuses at 12 weeks, at uh, 40, 16 weeks, at 22, 22 weeks, and between 26 and 28 weeks. If you compare these models, you see that even this tiny little one at seven weeks, it's a fully formed human being. The only difference between the fetuses is just size. And the only difference between the last one of 20, 26 to 28 weeks and a human being and a big person like me is just size. So right from the very beginning, a human being is formed. And there is no stage by which a baby is just a clot of blood. Like, like when you look at this fetus of, two weeks, of seven weeks, you see that it's a fully formed person and the mother has only missed two periods. And yet, when the mother aborts this baby, the mother is aborting a human being. So is abortion really an option? Is abortion ever an option? I'm going to give you a few minutes to discuss among yourself the various reasons that people give to have an abortion.
There are many reasons that people give. I don't want a baby. My husband doesn't want a baby. My boyfriend is no longer interested in me. My boyfriend doesn't want us to have a baby. My parents will be ashamed of me. My parents will be too disappointed in me. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm still in school. Whatever reason. I don't have money. Whatever reason people give. I want to ask you a question. Is there any one of those reasons that has no other solution apart from abortion? I'll give you a few minutes again to offer some of the solutions to some of the reasons that people give to have an abortion. What then should be our attitude when we're confronted with someone who wants to have an abortion? If you're confronted with a friend who wants to have an abortion, you need to find out, first of all, why they want to have the abortion. Then, compassionately and gently work out the issues with them and let them know that God can turn every disaster around for good. Give them hope. Give them other options and let them know there's nothing new under the sun and God can turn their situation around for good. There have been so many testimonies of people that thought life had come to an end because um, they were pregnant and they had the courage to have a child and the child became great in the hand of God. A God, child became a blessing to them. Uh, there are so many testimonies that we have written. And I will once again tell you to get a copy of this book, which says abortion, um, accidents and abortion, telling you the various um, um, hazards that happen to people, as well as some good, good stories as well, of people who decided not to have an abortion and how God turned it around for good. We have so many testimonies. There was a seminar I gave in which a doctor was telling us that when he was a medical student, he, his wife, he was already a mature person and his wife was expecting a third baby and he said, no, nope, he's going to terminate the baby. And he got some of his doctor friends to help him, but his doctor friends refused to do it for him. And he reluctantly, he, was, he allowed the baby to be born. Today, that baby is a doctor. We have many, many, many testimonies like that. The Lord will help us in Jesus. Now, I still remember, uh, uh, again, a testimony of a friend of mine who, who had fibroids and... Um, and, and then when she was pregnant, the doctors advised that she aborted the baby and she removed the, you know, they give her a history, remove the womb. She, they wanted to perform a hysterectomy on her to remove her womb and to remove her baby because they said the baby cannot survive. That the, the fibroids, her fibroids are so big, they're going to choke the baby. And she said, just give me a chance, just give me a chance. She kept praying, the baby today is a doctor. So there are so many situations like that in which we have seen the hand of God um, you know, sparing babies and making their life a blessing, even when people thought that, you know, uh, it's not going to work. So right now, we are going to counter what I would say pro-abortion arguments. Those of us who believe in the life of the baby, we are often called pro-life, and those who believe that babies should be aborted, although they are called pro-choice, I think the best thing is to say pro-death, because they believe the baby should die. Right. A man called Scott Klesendorf has done um, um, uh, a write-up to, sh to show that all the arguments for abortion, they fit into four reasons. And the four reasons have the acronym S-L-E-D, SLED. And that is, every reason for abortion is either because of the baby's size. They said the baby is too small and you cannot consider it as a human being. True. Embryos are smaller than newborns, yeah? But is that relevant? Do we want to say that when people are small, bigger people are, are more human? 
like men who are muscular, women who tend to be smaller, do we say men are more human than women? Or do we say uh, older people, because they are bigger, they are more human than little ones? No, we don't say that. So size doesn't equal value. Then the level of development. This was what I heard, this was what we were taught when we were in school, that the baby um, is too, is not fully formed, you know? That the baby's, the level of development is not complete, and so you can, you can still discard the baby. Embryo and fetuses truly are less developed than adults. But, four-year-olds are less developed than their mother. So, should older children have more rights than younger ones? Some people they even say that the baby's, you know, self-awareness, that a fetus is not aware of his being, therefore he can be, he can be killed, he can be aborted. But if that is true, even a little baby of a few weeks old is not aware of himself. So do you now kill the baby because of, he doesn't have, even some babies of a few months still are not fully aware of their person. Do you kill them because they lack self-awareness or do you kill people who have, a mental um, uh, dementia because they are not even aware of themselves. You can see that the people that promote abortion are the same people that promote euthanasia. They are the same people that promote um, all kinds of perversion. It's all connected. It's all the same spirit behind them all. Or some people say um, um, the environment, you know, that the baby is still in the womb. As you can't say it's a human being. It's not here on earth. You know, then the question I want to ask is that if a baby is in the womb and then eight inches down the birth canal is born, does the environment make him more human? Just moving eight inches away from a certain environment, does it make him more human? No. If you move away from your bed and you turn eight inches away, do you become a different person? No, you're still the same person. So environment also changing the, the location does not make people more valuable. Then the last thing is the D, which is dependence. That a baby is fully dependent on, it's not, it's not fully human because it's entirely dependent on, on, on the mother's, on the mother. Does that make somebody less human? If you're dependent on some, on even others, are you less human? If, if, if you, you are ill and somebody is helping you around, are you less human? Of course. Dependency does not equate value. So the challenge for people who are promoting abortion is to be intellectually honest by asking themselves the tough question, is this baby a human, is he a member of a human race, of the human race or not? Does the location change the humanity of the child? How can level of development, either physical, mental, or intellectual, determine a person's humanity? Those who promote abortion should be able to answer the questions without self-interest and focusing on truth. If they are true to themselves, they will see that abortion is never, never um, an answer. It's never, never right. Amen. I, I just want to talk a little bit more about the question, when does slavery really start? Because that was, that was what led me to begin to look into abortion issues and to study about abortion. I wanted to know when life starts. We're going to read Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 that says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. Then I'm going to read Luke chapter 1. Verse 35 to 38, which says, the, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be barren, is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered, May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. We see two things that talk about breath or uh, spirit. The first one is God breathed into man the breath of life. God put his nose into man's nose and breathed into him the breath of life. And the Bible says man became a living being. 
So what made man to become alive was the breath of God that he breathed into man. And that we saw where Angel Gabriel visited Mary and said that the, the spirit of God will come upon you and the, the power of God will overshadow you. So spirit, of course, you know, again, is the same breath that God breathed into man in Genesis. So Mary said, may it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her from that very day when the breath of the Holy Spirit entered into Mary's womb. That was the day the baby Jesus was conceived. So when does life start? Life starts on the very day the breath of God enters the womb of the woman. The breath of God fertilizes the egg and the sperm. Life starts from day one because life is dependent on the breath of God that goes into man. Amen. People who say, well, I don't know if that's really where life starts, then ask them, where do you think life starts? I have had discussion with people who say, well, I don't think that's when life I said, okay, you tell me where life starts. And they don't know. Some will tell you six weeks, some will tell you three months, some will tell you all kinds of, they don't know. The question is they don't know. I said, well, I know. I know. Because it's the day that the breath of God enters a human being. And that day is day one. Hallelujah. I've talked about the size, the level of dependency, the environment, the level of development, the environment and dependency. Another thing people say is that uh, the woman has a choice as to what to do with her body. Well, I'm here to inform us that the baby is not her body. Ordinary, simple biology will tell you the baby is in its own world. The mother, the, the mother of course is a woman and the baby can be a boy. So it's not her body. Sometimes they don't even share the same blood group. So it's not her body. They don't have the same genetic makeup. So it's not her body. They don't have the same DNA. So it's not her body. And nothing in them actually mixes. So it's not her body. The baby is just food and oxygen is just diffused into the baby's um, into the baby's bloodstream. The baby's blood and the mother's blood doesn't mix. So it's not her body. The baby is not her body. And that's why a woman can have a baby. And she, the baby is out of her body, and the woman is completely whole. She's complete. Nothing is missing. Just the baby has left, but nothing in her body is missing. She's complete. She's whole. Because the baby is not her body. Some people advocate that um, abortion should be used as a birth control measure. Well, I'm here to tell you that abortion is not a contraceptive. Because abortion does not prevent the formation of life. Abortion actually exterminates life. Abortion kills life. It doesn't prevent life from being, being formed. Rather, it ends a life that has formed. Therefore, abortion cannot be treated as a contraceptive method. talk right now about the issue of um, when a country legalizes abortion if a country legalizes abortion I say okay anybody wants to have an abortion can have it does it make it right the question I want to ask us is this does the legalization of something make it right does legalization make a wrong thing right if the country legalizes the use of marijuana for instance does it make it right? Does it make it less destructive? Or a country says, it's okay if you're in love with somebody, you, with your neighbor's wife, you can go and have sex with your neighbor's wife. Does it make it right? So it's not legalization that makes a wrong thing right. A, a thing is right if it's right, and it's wrong if it's wrong. Even if it's legalized and it's wrong, it is still wrong. 
I want to say that it is people who have wrong thinking and do not value the gods, have godly values that will say something that is wrong should be permitted. So legalization doesn't make it right. I want to say here that Christian doctors and Christian medical personnel should begin to stand up for what they believe and stand up and stay by, be willing to suffer consequences for what they believe. We have the Bible today. We can read the Bible. We have, we have God has made the word of God to change the whole of, of the earth because of people who are willing to take their life to translate the Bible. We have freedom today uh, as, as, as Africans to go to, to, to anywhere because people have stood to be able, there, was, there were people who stood against apartheid. There were people who stood against slavery. There were people who stood against racial discrimination because they were willing to take their life. And today we are benefiting from those things. Therefore, Christian personnel, medical personnel should be willing to take whatever it's going to take to stand for the word of God and to stand for what they believe, even if it means it's going to be at losses to themselves. It could be a whole generation or the next generation that we are protecting. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Legalization does not eliminate death in surgery. Even if uh, abortion is legalized, it doesn't mean that there will be no hazard, there will be no consequence, there will be no death, there will be no damage done through it. Legalization does not remove any of those things. Legalization just promotes the trade. It just promotes those who want to have an abortion. You know, uh, organizations that are promoting abortion, it just makes it easy for them to sell their products. That's all legalization does. In developing countries of the world, the most common reason that they give is that people will always have an abortion. And they're going to do it back street, back door. Why don't you do it properly where they will have um, the real um, um, medical expertise to help them so as to save life. This is a reason that is given in developing countries. And I want to say that that reason is false. Because what happens is that if in a backstreet abortion, the rate of death is 25 deaths to 100, which is a quarter, which is very, very high. All right? And that is the rate of abortion in people who do it backstreet. But if it is legalized, several people, thousands of people now have the freedom to do it. Let us say, for instance, let us, that is even too high. Let us say in backstreet abortion, let's say 90 people die out of 100. If 100 go backstreet, 90 people will die out of them. That's 90% mortality. And that is very, very high, right? But if abortion is legalized, then several people have the freedom to do it. Let's say just 1,000 people begin to have an abortion, and only 10% of them die. That is 100 compared to 90. And that difference of 10 is, is human life. Legalization of abortion makes it open to all children, teenagers, youths. People who would not do it, doctors who would not do it now because of the fear of government, now have the freedom to do it. Other people have the freedom to do it. And so thousands and thousands of people are having all kinds of free sex and, free abo I mean, and freedom to abort. So even if the percentage of death reduces because it's now in, in, indoor, in hospital, there is still a huge number of people compared to Backstreet when it is not allowed. So it is a false argument. Now, I want to talk about the hard cases. People say, what about the case of rape and incest? And these hard cases are used to promote the freedom for young people to have an abortion. We have written a book which is called, What About Rape? Please try and get a copy of the book, What About Rape? And in this, I have discussed of um, the issue of rape. First of all, what I want to say is that young people should be taught how to avoid rape. All right? And they can, they can, be, they can avoid rape by not exposing themselves to unnecessary danger. They can avoid rape by not walking in lonely spots alone at night. They can avoid rape by avoiding provocative dressing. 
by raising an alarm if accosted in an unwholesome manner and shouting for help, and by reporting immediately to higher authority. There are lots of things young people can do, to, or anybody can do to avoid rape. But I want to say here that even if a woman is raped and, or she has an incest with a sibling and she gets pregnant, the thing is, who is the offender? Surely the baby is not the offender. It's the person that commits the rape that is the offender. In, in, in that case, who should be put to death? Should it be the baby that should be put to death for not offending or the rapist? I think we know the obvious answer. So why should the baby be made to pay a death penalty for a sin of his father? So we should protect an innocent child from, from being killed because the father was a rapist. And also, of course, you know, even in case of rape, the baby is 50% of you and 50% of the baby, of the, of, the, of the rapist. So it's not just the rapist child, it's also your child as well. We have discussed extensively about rape in that book. I want to say something about campus students, college students, university students. In my interaction with university students, I find they give rape as the highest reason for wanting to have an abortion. And my discussion, my discovery is that in most of those cases, they were actually not raped. They either had a sex with their boyfriend at a time they didn't want to have sex. All right? But it's something they had been doing, and it's usually either in their bedroom or the boyfriend's bedroom. Or it, it's, it's some form of mutual consent. That's usually some form of mutual consent. And it may not even be the first or the second or the third time that things like that have been going on. And there was this mutual consent. And then she got, she got pregnant and said, I was raped. But she actually invited the rape. So we need to look at this thing very closely. It has been discovered in true rape cases, the incidence of pregnancy, the likelihood of pregnancy is 0.01 or less. Because the woman psychologically shuts, shuts down and the body cannot, cannot retain uh, conception under that situation. So much fear, so much trauma that is involved. So, but if a woman gets pregnant as a, from rape, all she needs is a lot of loving support from the family, from the community, from the church to help her to overcome a lot of the trauma, a, a, a lot of the trauma that she has gone through, a lot of love, a lot of therapeutic healing. That is what she needs, not to compound her guilt, her guilt and her, her sorrow by killing a baby. The other argument people give is threat to mother's health. And in this threat to mother's health, I have, I have, um, I have streamlined the, the reasons for either ectopic pregnancy or cardiac problem. Now I want to talk about ectopic pregnancy. When a, baby, when, when a woman has a baby in the fallopian tube, the baby cannot survive there. You cannot call that abortion. See, people use that to intimidate pro-life people and to corner pro-life people and to make them to get to a point where, they say, where people will say, okay, then that is okay. That abortion is it's okay. And once you say abortion is okay, it's okay. But actually, when we read the book of Numbers, we read, we, we read where God was saying, if there is a death that is unintentional, then the slayer should not be handed over to the avenger of blood because he did not plan to do it. It wasn't an intentional death, even if it was with an instrument. And in cases of ectopic pregnancy, if you're going to leave the baby there, the mother is going to die, the, womb, the baby is going to die. And so the, 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 the fetus is removed, to the, the tube where the, the, the baby is formed, plus the fetus in it, is removed. Otherwise, the woman, you're going to kill the woman and the child will still die. I don't think that is abortion. That is definitely not abortion. And even in a case like that, a woman is sorrowing, she's lost her child. She didn't want her child to die. Abortion is a deliberate killing of a human being. In this case, it's like a miscarriage, just like miscarriage as well. It's not intentional. A woman like that needs a lot of love, a lot of tender loving care to overcome, you know, the trauma of having an ectopic pregnancy. That is not an abortion. 
Now, what about cardiac cases? People have told me of very, very serious cardiac cases where the woman is on heavy, heavy cardiac medication and she, she's pregnant and then she, she cannot. I'm going to say that even if she has the abortion, she's still going to have a lot of trauma from her heart. And I think if a woman has a cardiac situation, she needs a good doctor. She needs a good doctor. And the essence of a good doctor is to spare the mother and spare the child. People like that can be monitored closely until the baby can come out. And doctors would even tell you a, a cardiac, a cardiac a, a pregnancy is not a problem for a cardiac situation until the last trimester. The last trimester between the sixth month and the ninth month. And between those six months and nine months, the baby can be brought out and put in an incubator to leave. We should not use cardiac situation as an excuse to promote abortion. So now, in a country, like I said, where abortion is allowed, I want to challenge Christians to please speak up and doctors to boldly speak up for their conscience and refuse to be part of the evil of abortion. Here ends part two. God bless you.